you are listening to us wherever wherever you are. Uh, it is a great pleasure, honor, and uh, really with a lot of satisfaction that uh, we see Dr. Basudar Jalal in front of us, um, the oldest friend of the uh, South Asian Democratic Forum. Uh, we usually refer to you as the godmother of SADF because uh, you assisted us in our first steps. You taught us how uh, was uh, the women's life and challenges in your country, in Afghanistan. We uh, suffered a lot uh, seeing uh, the persecution you had been uh, targeted with, especially in the last year that was, I'm certain, uh, very painful to you. And uh, you are now in Europe um, for some time, as you probably will explain later. And uh, the whole of the idea of this uh, gathering is uh, to uh, say how wonderful it is that you are safe and sound and ready to go for the Afghan women and uh, for, the, uh, for the women cause. Um, that is, I think, indistinguishable from Afghanistan to wherever in the world. Uh, if you allow me also to say that uh, although um, our efforts were not directly successful, and I am sorry for this, but I, I would like to testify that uh, uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Sophie Vilmes uh, of Belgium, she did whatever she could to... Uh, take you out of Afghanistan um, and uh, I am very thankful to her and uh, to her efforts and I would like to, to get this testimony here um, and uh, just to say that the, the whole idea is to just to uh, allow you to, to speak and to say and to explain uh, how is it I mean uh, how is uh, Dr. Masuda Jalal uh women um scholar psychiatric doctor um pediatric doctor um political leader candidate for the presidency of uh, your country the first ever minister uh, for women affairs in your country and uh, the challenges you have in front in front of you now how was it i mean tell us a bit about all of this fascinating life that has been yours up to now. Uh, first of all, I want to greet you and all participants in this uh, webinar. Um, thank you so much for for, um, uh, for preparing and organizing this uh, webinar, which is so much needed at this uh, current situation of Afghanistan. Um, and. Um, uh, I want to greet all the participants of this webinar and I want to thank you again for uh, more than one decade of uh, great efforts uh, that you are making for um, great support from this part of the world to uh, South Asian women. That I am one of the witnesses for all those uh, support that you are providing and efforts that you are making. I have noted down my um, notes. I would like to... Uh, to read from my papers, but then I will leave the floor open for the questions of the participants uh, to answer. Uh, the military and uh, reconstruction uh, caused by United States in Af uh, Afghanistan has been estimated one trillion US dollar since the war against Taliban began in 2001. There have been more than 3,500 coalition deaths of which more than 2,300 have been United States soldiers. Since 2014 to 2019, 45,000 members of Afghanistan National Security and Defense Forces were killed. So the current situation of Afghanistan, the chaos that we are uh, talking about, uh, how it happened and what is the causes. So I want to um, explain some of the causes of the current chaos. The uh, strategic importance of um, United States of America uh, rather than the past has been decreased and it has been reflected in foreign policy and political defense and security doctrine 
of United States has more attention has been taken from the Middle East to China. This is one of the main reason. Also training and supporting the Afghan army that during the past um, 20 years has have been proved not to be useful. It was resulted useless. The Doha agreement impacted the current chaos of Afghanistan. Since uh, 5,000 prisoners of Taliban were released and military intervention of United States uh, and coalition forces um, uh, um, in war against Taliban was stopped one year ago when the Doha agreement was made. And also the um, withdrawal of the international forces uh, happened in an irresponsible way, unuseful way and with hurry. There has not been a regional powers cooperation and collaboration with the world powers to prevent the current chaos of Afghanistan. And also another point and another factor contributing to the current chaos of Afghanistan is the carelessness of powers of what today politically and security wise happened in my country, Afghanistan. I can say that people of Afghanistan lost peace in Doha and they lost war in Kabul. And, and Afghanistan problem has no military solution. In my idea, 43 years of war and conflict in this country is enough for Afghanistan, for region and for the whole world. The solution for Afghanistan is to promote peace and to bring the uh, inclusive government. The humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan has been deepening due to conflict, recurrent natural disasters and chronic poverty and COVID-19. Thousands of Afghans have been displaced, killed and injured. One third of Afghan people suffer from hunger and 16 million out of 32 million of Afghan population are survivors and will be survival depending on humanitarian aid. According to the United Nations, Afghanistan has the third largest displaced population in the world. Since the end of May 2020, the number of people displaced because of conflict more than doubled, totaling 550,000 and driving an immediate surge in urgent humanitarian needs. Total number of IDPs up to now are 3.5 million. Some 12.2 million people are already uh, acutely food insecure, and the majority of those will be further affected by the latest in a series of droughts. The 2021 drought comes while many Afghans are still recovering from the effects of a 2018 drought, which left many farmers and pas pastoralists displaced and or selling off livestock and assets often at loss in order to survive. Half a million Afghan children are facing risks of drought right now. According to estimates, the rate of severe acute malnutrition for children is 900,000 and of moderate acute malnutrition is uh, 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 in Afghan children, 3.1 million children. The cost of wheat, rice, sugar, and cooking oil have all increased by more than 50% compared to pre-COVID-19 prices. Afghanistan economy is on the way to collapse. If economic collapse happens in Afghanistan, humanitarian status will get worse. Pressures on people to leave the country will get more. Dangers initiated from Afghanistan will more affect the international community. Winter is coming soon. Thousands of IDPs will need food, clothes, and shelter. In the past 20 years, 75% of Afghan economy depended on international support. With, with cut off the international assistance, poverty and joblessness will reach its peak. The obvious inability of Taliban to decrease the economic crisis will worsen the humanitarian status of Afghanistan. We need to um, concentrate on effective and quick solution. We cannot wait further. Afghan women face fear, desperation, and uncertain future by the current uh, political settlement that happened one month ago, one and a half month ago in Kabul. 
There are fear of a woman's freedom to work, to dress as they choose, or even to leave home alone under Taliban rule. Taliban closed down the Ministry of Women's Affairs and replaced it with the Ministry of Rights and Virtue. They have banned girls from going to schools, press uh, freedom, freedom of expression, assembly and association is gone. Violation of international human rights laws, according to United Nations assistance mission in Afghanistan, the Taliban were responsible for 45% of attacks that caused civilians deaths and injuries in the first nine months of 2020. In early July 2021, Taliban leaders who took control of the provinces of Badakhshan and Taghar issued an order to local leaders to provide them with a list of girls over the age of 15 and widows under the age of 45 for marriage with Taliban fighters. It is not yet known whether they have compiled. If these forced marriages take place, women and girls will be taken to Waziristan, Pakistan to be re-educated and converted to authentic Islam. This order has caused profound fear among women and their families living in these areas and forced them to flee and join in the ranks of internally displaced persons. Adding to the humanitarian disaster unfolding in Afghanistan in the past three months alone, 900,000 people have been displaced. The Taliban directive serves as a stark warning of what lies ahead and a harsh reminder of their brutal 1996 to 2001 regime during which women were subjected to persistent human rights, violations denied employment and education, forced to wear the burqa and forbidden from leaving home without a male guardian or muharram. Despite claiming they have changed their stance on women's rights, the Taliban actions and latest efforts to commit thousands of women to sexual slavery demonstrate quite the opposite furthermore. The Taliban have signaled their intention to deny girls' education to one woman from employment and, and to political participation are under grave threat. I propose that under the guidance of Resolution 1820 that highlights the importance of including women as equal participants in the peace processes and condemns all forms of uh, gender violence against civilians in armed conflicts to ensure the Afghan women rights enshrined in Afghanistan's constitution, national legislation and international laws are respected. Also, uh, uh, although Taliban declared gender segregation in universities and dress code, women protesters were brutally treated and media is undergone scrutiny. But this time Taliban faced two new phenomena, which are active women leaders and independent media and press. Thousands of women in sports are banned. Girls footballists are exercising uh, in Portugal right now. 6,000 female judges are at home hiding and imprisonment themselves at the criminals they judged and decided are released from prisons. 7,000 women health workers are at home and health system is in collapsing status. Already 2,000 health centers are closed. The Taliban takeover of the country of the country could once again turn Afghanistan into a terrorist safe haven, as the group is believed to maintain ties with Al Qaeda and other terroristic groups. Hence, need for humanitarian aid because humanitarian needs don't wait for a political settlement. Hunger kills and disease spreads, as the political concept context in Afghanistan shifts its humanitarian crisis depends, it is critical to remember that principled, accountable, uh, properly targeted humanitarian assistance can be delivered in Afghanistan. On the 8th of September 2021, the Taliban appointed cabinet of 33 ministers. All appointees are leaders from the Taliban movement. There are at least six on the uh, UN sanctions list. 
With an inclusive uh, government, Afghanistan could have opened a channel with the international community to receive a first tranche of origin funding to help our people in crisis. Afghans could have pulled together expertise and set up task forces to manage the food, health, housing, and dis displacement crisis. But the people crisis was not the Taliban priority. Exclusionary policies hunting down activists and suppressing uh, dissent was their priority. Raiding offices, inspecting homes, shooting off, uh, uh, shooting at crowds was their priorities. Given media interviews, holding press conferences, and and boasting in their triumph was a priority to them. The Taliban's lack of perspectives, foresight, and humility show that they put their ideology over people's lives and they and that they are unfit to govern a nation in crisis. The Afghan people right to elect their own leaders has been suppressed and an illegal government has been forced upon us. Female journalists from state TV have been dismissed and the journalists who covered the protests have been un unlawfully arrested and detained. They, they have executed systematic raids, inspections of homes and offices of their dissenters. People of Afghanistan stands are. We people of Afghanistan stand up for for our rights to choose our own leaders. Inclusive govern governance is the only path to an enduring peace. There is no other path. We do not have to accept a government appointed through handful of private meetings and a press conference. The interim government should be inclusive and representative of all ethnic groups and genders. It should open a way for a free and fair elections that women and men of Afghanistan have chance to participate in the selection of future government. Again, we people of Afghanistan demand that to be done on the basis of free, fair and transparent election process under the monitoring and supervision of the international community. UN sanctioned ministers uh, should be immediately removed from government, of, from government, And Afghanistan needs the services of skilled and qualified women and men in all sectors, including women without prejudice, both in government offices and NGOs. I think no country, no European country or Western governments should recognize the Taliban. This should be a red line. The Taliban doesn't meet any requirement for a legitimate government. Recognition must be conditional to only an inclusive government uh, can be recognized. Providing humanitarian aid to Afghanistan through women organizations so that the aid reaches those affected directly, particularly women and children. The world and EU should help to form an inclusive government in Afghanistan. In such a government, women must be given half of the power. Women should have an, a leading role in overseeing compliance with, with the democratic constitution. The government must be representative, democratic, and externally peace-oriented, guided by the principles of human rights and international agreements to which Afghanistan has committed itself. The EU should use its influence to attach conditions to the release of funds only if there is an inclusive government should funds be released. The UN and EU should influence governments with empathy to Taliban to push for an inclusive government in Afghanistan. Dear, mm -hmm. dear Masuda, thank you so much. Uh, you, you are, as always, very modest. So you didn't start by speaking about yourself. Uh, and before getting into um, this very, very uh, dense and uh, concentrated political message, just allow me one question. Uh, how could you find courage 
uh, when the Taliban forbid you from working, uh, you were not, no longer able to work in the psychiatric hospital because it was destroyed because of the civil war. You could, uh, you tried to make your best to, as a doctor, the Taliban forbid you, and you faced them. You did not go back. I mean, if you just could say a word about that, because I think your energy, your example, is absolutely fundamental, not only for your country, but to the whole of us. Um, yes, um, during, uh, um, after Soviet Union uh, left Afghanistan, uh, so my uh, profession was in the field of uh, psychiatry, but civil war started and that department got uh, completely destroyed. So that um, I had to shift to another um, field, which was um, uh, pediatrics. So I, I was shifted to that uh, department and then I, uh, when uh, Taliban in 96 came, so then they um, pushed or they, by force, they stopped my work in, uh, uh, in that area. So meanwhile, I was uh, teaching a uh, Kabul University Medical uh, Institute, a medical faculty, uh, and a professor I was. So that work was stopped because uh, women were not allowed anymore to teach or anymore to be um, in that sector by the edict um, that was uh, uh, released by their head at that time. So I was stopped working. So uh, meanwhile, since I was a part-time um, uh, um, uh, health uh, part-time consultant in UN agencies, so I fully uh, started work with UN agencies, but in a low-profile way, and uh, I was in the leadership of women and health programs uh, with United Nations until um, 2001. That the international community came in Afghanistan. Then I entered politics. Thank you very much, and I would like to to testify that uh, you stayed. Uh, in uh, your country nearly to the last possible moment. Uh, you always refused to leave it because uh, you were, even in face of a tremendous pressure, you were leading thousands of women uh, for defending their rights across your country. And I could see it, uh, not as well as I would like to, but I could follow you and I was always thinking of you as, a, as a, a hero. You are a hero for all of those who believe in equal rights, who believe uh, that uh, women are uh, equal. Uh, you are a hero. Um, you are uh, putting things in practice. And my admiration for you is absolutely boundless, my dear uh, Masuda. I would like to say that to you. And uh, uh, comments are, are arriving, uh, not really questions. We have uh, a comment from uh, Mansur Khan, uh, who, who says that uh, inclusive government through democratic representation is the only way for achieving peace in Afghanistan. I mean, if I did well understand your words, what you are saying is that... Uh, the inclusive government must be a step for elections, for having, uh, there must be a provisional inclusive government that will, most important task will be the preparation of elections. Uh, could you tell us, how do you think uh, you could help this process going on? How do you think uh, that things can develop uh, being uh, conscious uh, that uh, the Taliban, uh, the hardline Taliban, the Taliban have, uh, as we know, uh, a lot of divisions among themselves, but the hardliners are in uh, real uh, command. Uh, they didn't show any um, uh, intention of changing their ways. They continue to be what they are. Um, could you tell us a bit, how do you think it will be possible for you to um, put things moving in a different direction from what uh, we are seeing uh, right now in the country? 
Well, uh, um, uh, what I realized for uh, um, that you are uh, asking me uh, about the mechanism and that how we can, uh, what is the map to, to reach uh, the inclusive with uh, not recognition of uh, current political settlement and uh, not unblocking the money that they want. Uh, so um, uh, they will come. Uh, to, to a conclusion that they should accept the inclusive government. And it, uh, inclusive government can come out of an uh, international conference on, on Afghanistan, uh, like Bonn One conference in 2001, uh, that uh, from all uh, political and social groups represented came together in Bonn One, uh, in Bonn conference in 2001. And uh, from also representatives from the regional countries, neighbors, and uh, from uh, UN and the international community. The UN uh, held the conference, so that can be copied again, that concept. And in one of the countries around Afghanistan, I mean, or where, wherever that is uh, uh, possible, uh, UN can hold uh, an international conference on Afghanistan, and uh, the current political settlement can send their representatives, and there, all of them can um, come together and, uh, and come to an agreement for inclusive government. And uh, the inclusive government can be decided and agreed in this international conference and will uh, operate for six months to 18 months or to one year, whatever that they decide. And um, then this interim administration, um, in, in, uh, which we call uh, inclusive government, can um, prepare for the general election. So this is the map. Um, of, of the way to go to reach uh, to the to the solution of uh, inclusive government, and then the whole world, United Nations, and the um, international community can provide support for inclusive government uh, to go ahead and to be successful. So I think this is the only um, key solution to the challenge and the chaos that we all are facing uh, in Afghanistan. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, you are getting to uh, be very concrete because uh, the, the United Nations Security Council spoke about uh, inclusive government, uh, but uh, I haven't seen nothing coming out of there. You have precise proposals. Uh, you speak uh, of an international conference. Um, uh, tell me, you... Um, I mean, I don't know uh, if you want to disclose... Uh, where you are or if you do not it's it's up to you but uh, how do you see uh, what is necessary don't you think it would be a very good idea that uh, the united nations would start by uh, being inclusive um, and so listening uh, to the personalities that were left out and starting exactly by uh, what is the biggest black hole on uh, the Taliban construction, which is exactly women. And to do so, uh, I mean, uh, someone like you that has been all the time during the last 20 years in the front line of the women combat in politics, minister for women affairs, presidential candidate, I mean, you should be given the floor. Um, don't you think that uh, we should all those um, that uh, uh, think uh, it's the uh, equality between women and men is an important principle. We should all press for the United Nations, for the Security Council to, uh, to listen to you, to allow you to uh, present uh, the um, roadmap. Because exactly as you said, um, you have over 40 years of war and uh, war did not uh, give a solution, did not improve the prospects of the Afghan people. So perhaps it would be the time to think of a different way of dealing with the things. A woman that is not, um, does not have an army uh, behind her, but has a very powerful argument. Uh, how, how do you think this could be start? moving this process? Well, uh, the start point will be um, the United Nations should have a facilitating rule, coordinating rule, and uh, supervising rule, and bringing um, Afghans to speak in uh, um, uh, General Assembly, 
and in other side events uh, on Afghanistan and uh, gathering the opinion and uh, moving this, um, starting this process and moving it forward. So once uh, United Nations um, finds out where the conference should be, so um, the conference um, previously was to be taken place in uh, Turkey and Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs of Turkey uh, for, for the whole one month uh, got uh, active and busy on this. And uh, so again, they can approach maybe Turkey or, or whatever other uh, country that they want and uh, start um, uh, working on holding a conference on Afghanistan, international conference on Afghanistan. And the United Nations can start talking to the current political settlement that they cannot uh, go ahead without um, finances and without technical help. I mean, they have to, uh, uh, they have to have, we have to come to a point uh, or a conclusion that uh, they should uh, accept uh, in an inclusive uh, representative government and they should uh, take part in this uh, international conference and what this international conference uh, decide and agree uh, um, they all need to be uh, agreeing and uh, having Afghanistan go forward uh, with the um, help of United Nations and international community. I think this is uh, once um, ex uh, experienced uh, 20 years ago and the same thing can be start, same uh, procedures and same process uh, can be started again. United uh, UNAMA in Afghanistan uh, has the experience uh, so they can start and uh, they, can, uh, they can move forward. And they can bring uh, those international um, expertise that uh, uh, helped uh, Afghanistan in 2001. And uh, all those expertise come together, plus uh, Afghans uh, expertise and think tanks and um, Afghan uh, pol independent politicians and representative for all different social uh, political group and ethnic group, uh, women, men. Um, so they all come together and uh, they decide on Afghanistan and they get uh, into agreement and then uh, they go to Kabul to put the agreement into practice. I think this is uh, very clear uh, what, uh, what, you have, uh, what, uh, what you have in mind. Uh, now uh, the issue is uh, um, how can uh, we start moving for, for this aim? I mean... Uh, do you think, when do you think you will need to have, uh, uh, to live, uh, I mean, to be uh, able to move from your country, uh, to speak with, uh, with the international leaders? Um, how, when do you think we can put all of this uh, moving uh, for uh, achieving the results uh, that uh, you are just speaking about? Exactly making this international conference and to provoke... Uh, this inclusive uh, uh, government. Yes, so I am ready to to help my country and my people um, to the extent that I can. I I am uh, completely prepared to to, to have travels and trips um, to whatever country that is needed to world leaders to um, leadership of United Nations and to have this concept. Uh, um, uh, to have this concept realized and uh, people to come together, the think tanks on Afghanistan, nationally, regionally, and internationally, uh, and to take a practical step because uh, uh, Afghanistan uh, cannot wait anymore and we shouldn't give Taliban time. Absolutely. I think uh, this message is uh, absolutely clear. Uh, we are uh, waiting for uh, other points to, to be uh, to be uh, to be added to to our to our discussion um, because I I understand we have a very clear and concrete proposal. Uh, in the meantime, we have uh, the whole of uh, the, the the Afghanistan uh, foreign affairs structure, namely the embassies uh, that uh, are remaining uh, in there uh, where they are. Uh, and not being, uh, and they do not recognize uh, the the Taliban power. Uh, don't you think that uh, uh, these uh, embassies should uh, provide uh, a support for uh, the Afghan people and the Afghan representatives to get together in this uh, conference you are speaking about? 
Of course, I mean, uh, the international stakeholders and um, supporters, uh, they should uh, they should support. Without their support, it's not possible, yeah? To the individuals of these uh, think tanks that we are talking about, that they can come together and start having debate and on Afghanistan, that uh, step by step, uh, but very urgently it can go, it can reach to a point to have the international conference held and then go to Kabul to implement it. Very good. Uh, and the diplomats, the Afghan diplomats uh, can also be a very important support for what uh, you are speaking about. The, the, the core of the issue is exactly to uh, reach an agreement where uh, all uh, the social groups, women and men, they are present, um, ethnic uh, and so forth, can be uh, actors in the making of uh, this, uh, uh, this inclusive government. Uh, that's, yes. the key, that's the key point as I see it. So you are very clear that recognition of the Taliban never. Um, working for an inclusive government, certainly. In the meantime, um, there are uh, urgent needs because uh, you spoke about the drought that is uh, uh, provoking suffering in your country. Um, there are uh, urgent uh, humanitarian um, needs as for assistance uh, uh, to your country. Uh, how do you think, what do you think that should be done in this circumstance? Uh, how could it be achieved? How can it be canalized, this support, knowing that uh, 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 the, the Taliban might use uh, this as a leverage to uh, get uh, any sort of recognition? Uh, well, uh, it is co completely obvious that the uh, Taliban doesn't uh, have the requirements um, of a, a government uh, to be recognized. And uh, they know it, people of Afghanistan know it, all the world knows this. So, um, so it is better for them to be negotiated, uh, to come to the table and uh, to help people of Afghanistan uh, and people of Afghanistan to reach um, uh, an inclusive representative government. Uh, to have uh, the international support and people of Afghanistan can be saved uh, and uh, survived at these critical moments uh, of our history where um, uh, we are facing the climate change uh, as droughts and uh, we are facing the COVID-19 um, as victims and uh, also we are facing um, extremism uh, as victims. So the three uh, global challenges that human community are facing, but these three uh, and three challenges is, uh, are hitting Afghanistan the most because we are poor and we are uh, war torn and we are 43 years uh, living in war and conflict. And uh, we are ruined many times, uh, materially, intellectually, psychologically from many different points of angles. So that is why I hope that um, even the current political settlement uh, they can show empathy and sympathy to Afghan people. And they can come to cooperate and collaborate with the United Nations to have this conference happening. And as you said that uh, our uh, diplomats in our Afghanistan embassies, they are not replaced yet. So they, they are uh, in their embassies, uh, they are at work if they don't have salaries, but they can take a um, grand role in, this, uh, in holding this conference, this international conference on Afghanistan. Very good. I think uh, this is uh, the main conclusion we can uh, uh, take out of our conversation, that uh, it is urgent to uh, start uh, the procedures to launch a, a, a great conference where uh, women will be um, at the center stage, they will not be sidelined, and political uh, forces, uh, minorities will be considered and uh, where uh, the future of uh, a democratic uh, Afghanistan will be considered. I think this main message uh, it will be really the core for the future. Regarding you know, the 20 years that, that have passed and uh, 
uh, the, um, you spoke about uh, several elements and several uh, issues mm -hmm. that uh, uh, obviously did not go the best of the ways. Um, there have been several assessments. Um, I, uh, of course, geopolitically, uh, it has been very, very difficult to understand uh, what has been uh, the course of action of uh, uh, the United States, and uh, if there is really any rationality behind it, it's it's a big, a big question, a big if. Uh, but uh, uh, going beyond uh, the, these issues, um, one one of the one of the things that have been uh, very much uh, put to the fore uh, as um, a critical appreciation uh, was uh, the, um, the very high level of uh, centralization of the political power uh, in Kabul uh, in uh, uh, during these twenty years uh, that. Uh, Possibly marginalized a lot of a lot of people, a lot of structures. Uh, how do you think? Uh, what do you think that could be done better than was done up to now? Um, to in terms of the political architecture, to avoid some of the problems that hindered the this uh, uh, the this democratic phase of the Afghan uh, nation these twenty years that passed. Well, uh, to the first part, uh, part of what you said, uh, if women this time could be given the um, opportunity to initiate uh, the process and to lead the process, Afghan women, as they, they have suffered the most during the 43 years of war and conflict, and they have been um, marginalized and suffered mostly during uh, the late 90s, um, um, uh, marginalizing policies and uh, ideologies that came uh, on the on the uh, on the front uh, to the political scenario of Afghanistan and also now in in 2021 and the, the, this current political settlement uh, that you are the witness that is uh, doing uh, what they were doing uh, the same as uh, late 90s on women so that's why women are deserved Afghan women leaders to be given the opportunity to initiate this process for inclusive government and to take it forward. Uh, women, uh, I think that women uh, can safeguard the constitutional rights and the democratic values. And they should be given the equal, the meaningful uh, power to for a sustained peace and for a sustained democracy in Afghanistan. And for the second part of uh, what you just um, explained, uh, that what could have been done during the past um, two decades to uh, ha to have had better results, uh, maybe if uh, uh, if uh, we uh, if the rampant corruption that is one of the internal cause for today's chaos in Afghanistan, it could have been tackled. That we could have, that the uh, international community could have uh, left behind a transparent government, because the the internal uh, factors that uh, caused uh, the current chaos and the collapse of Kabul was uh, dissonance, the lack of concentration, uh, and the lack of coordination of security organs, and the lack of uh, uh, concentration in the commandership uh, towards fight uh, uh, against Taliban. And the rampant corruption, and also the leadership failure, and uh, and the nepotism, and the women are twenty four percent of the civil servants. So it, it could have been increased. So if we could uh, empower more women uh, during the past two decades, and we could have concentrated on the government to be transparent and strong. And also, you know that how much the corruption affected the war against Taliban? Uh, the um, uh, former finance minister has said that, has confessed that, that the, um, what was announced, the number of soldiers we had in three security organs was 350,000. But the real number was 50 to 70,000. So the rest of uh, um, funds, or the rest of budget uh, was getting distributed among commanders. 
Mm-hmm. So you see that uh, we didn't have that number that was announced of soldiers. So if we go and assess the internal um, um, factors and causes of Kabul um, collapse, so the the, um, uh, the the majority of the causes that we study is the corruption. So the the international community with all these trillions of dollars uh, expenditure and thousands of lives lives lost could have tried to leave a transparent government behind, a transparent democratic government behind, where uh, women women could have equal power in the government, equal participation and equal power in all uh, layers of power and in all layers of the administration. Well, uh, this is, uh, you are touching, you know, an issue that is very dear to me, you know, because I uh, was in the European Parliament for 10 years and uh, uh, I was, uh, the 10 years I was in the budget control uh, of a um, uh, committee of the European Parliament and one, one of the major issues was, was not Afghanistan, was Iraq, it was not very different because uh, uh, in Iraq we saw exactly the same thing. We one realized that uh, a lot of the Iraqi army was fictional uh, because uh, just the structures were inventing soldiers to pocket the money of the uh, salaries. This was classic. Uh, but just let me tell you about one of the experiences I had in 2008 where I was sent officially by the president of the European Parliament to Iraq to investigate what was going on. And actually, uh, as I found out, you know, with the details later on by WikiLeaks, you know, because uh, there was an American diplomat that make, made a, <laughs> a complete statement and, and understood everything that was going on there. Uh, and she explained uh, that uh, the European Union ambassador forbid all Iraqis to speak to me. And they invented that I, I mean, what about the schools and the hospitals and whatever that uh, uh, were supposed to be done? Oh, we cannot go for security reasons. I mean, they, uh, uh, it was absolutely a great scandal um, that I, what I saw there. I saw um, things, you know, well, by the United Nations, for instance, that are absolutely unbelievable, uh, where the main victim uh, is actually, uh, was, was actually the Iraqi people. And I think... Uh, I can imagine that things, unfortunately, uh, were not very different in Afghanistan. And this is something that uh, it is up to us um, in the West, in Europe, in the United States, to behave properly and not allow this kind of thing to happen. But if you allow me, uh, we, have, we have a question here from uh, 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 Dr. Siegfried Wolf. Um, if you allow me, I will read it to you. Dear Dr. Jalal, Thank you very much for all your insights you shared with us. I have two very specific questions uh, to you. Uh, uh, one, do you see a difference in the treatment of women of belonging to the majority, majority Pashtun community or to ethnic minority groups like Uzbeks or Tajiks? First question. Second question. You mentioned that Afghan women and girls are taken by the Taliban into Pakistan for re-education. Would you describe this process as kidnapping and forced marriage? Yeah, please, the floor is yours. Well, um, as far as we witnessed, um, so in uh, Tahar province and Badakhshan province is mainly um, consist of um, uh, Tajiks, Uzbeks and Turkmens and which is called uh, minorities. Um, so uh, the, the order that was given to the local leaders in these two provinces in the north to list the girls under 15 and the widows over 45 uh, to marry the Talib fighters. So it, uh, it happened in those two provinces, uh, which is located in the north and which is consist of other minorities uh, to marry and then to be taken to Waziristan uh, for uh, re-education on, on their religion. So and that happened in those two provinces and people g- got very much afraid and a lot of uh, displacement took place in those two provinces. So these two provinces uh, are not uh, 
from the ethnicity that the uh, Taliban is mostly from. Uh, so it happened uh, as a matter of fact, and uh, everybody is witness. And uh, the, the, the order that they give it to the local leaders, it came out to the social, social media. And uh, a lot, I mean, um, many women and their families got displaced from those areas due to the fear and the, from, from this fact. So um, this was the case. Yeah. And the second part of the question was? Uh, you mentioned that Afghan women and girls are taken by the Taliban into Pakistan for re-education. Would you describe this process as kidnapping and forced marriage? Well, uh, this um, order was given in two uh, provinces that we heard. And um, many families escaped from those provinces. So, and uh, the, uh, what was on the, on the order was to uh, get married with, the, um, uh, with their fighters and to be taken to um, the Waziristan for re-education on the religion. So means that um, the, the, the brutal uh, interpretation of the religion that they have, so they, they meant that uh, to be re-educated. So afterwards, what would happen to them? So uh, it, should have been, it should have been investigated. Th thank you very much, Dr. Jalal. I think this was very clear. You, you did uh, uh, mention before forced marriage, and slavery um, yes. and, uh, what is going on and of course this is uh, absolutely unbearable and I, I am absolutely certain that all the true um, friends of uh, women rights uh, cannot tolerate uh, these sort of things and uh, they have to support you uh, the, with all they what we, we can do. I think this is very, very clear. I think that uh, you um, made, as always, uh, a great show of uh, perseverance. You are there. Uh, Taliban did not finish with you. Uh, you. They have to count with you and they have to face the women of Afghanistan. And uh, uh, your proposal is very concrete and uh, i will uh, in my capacity my humble capacity try to transmit to um, the united nations that uh, this is a must i mean they have to act they have to invite you to uh, and they have to put in motion what they promised of this inclusive government uh, as soon as possible uh, we are very grateful for your participation um, as you know, uh, we are very much indebted to you for all your guidance, for for your example, for your example. You are a, you are the example of uh, uh, what should be a political leader. Um, we are very grateful as institution. I personally am very very indebted to you. Uh, we uh, will do whatever we can in our humble capacity to support you. And uh, I would just like to say, uh, well, keep on. Never, never, never give up. Uh, continue to be what I knew you were 10 years ago and you are today. Um, and uh, thank you so much for coming. I don't know if you want to have a few words to our audience before uh, we finish. Well, um, at last, I want to propose that. And this time, if the lead could be given to Afghan women leaders to initiate the process for sustainable peace and democratic representative government in Afghanistan, that would create a history for Afghan women. And uh, I want this honor to go to Afghanistan women since they suffered mostly and, uh, and more than men. And uh, we have had so far a male dominated history. So let's uh, our history opens a new chapter by women leadership thank you very much thank you to all of you that have been uh, listening to us uh, albino that have, has been responsible for the technical part of uh, um, of the webinar uh, thank you to all of, of those who intervened and uh, i'm looking forward to continue our cooperation and uh, i wish you all the success all the best for the sake of afghan 
women and your country at large. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much, Xiaomi. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Thank Goodbye. You. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Goodbye.